Welcome to Explore the World, JCCC Travelers to the Middle East. You know me, I'm Jeanette from the International Education Office. It is my pleasure to be the moderator today. So we are recording this session. We will post it to our website. If you have any concerns about that, now is your time to take whatever action you feel is appropriate. So we can't send students to the world or faculty to the world right now, which we're really sad about, but we're bringing the world to JCCC. And one of the ways is through this speaker series. We do have recordings from previous sessions. They are on our website. Um, Brooke will go ahead and put that address in the chat box and so you can see it if you wanna go back. And speaking of the chat box, our presenters today are going to take questions at the end. Um, and the way you're gonna ask your question is through the chat box. So feel free to go in at any time and type your question in. Today's session will feature three JCCC faculty and staff who have studied, traveled, lived, worked in the Middle East. We're really grateful to them and say thank you in advance for giving us your time and telling us about your experiences. First up, and we're not gonna waste any time because I wanna give all the time to them. First up is Professor Don Gale, who's a professor of philosophy. Dawn has traveled extensively in Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. She and her family spent the summer of 2018 in Israel, where she worked on an additional graduate degree at Hebrew University. When we can travel again, JCC, uh, Dawn will co-lead a JCCC study abroad trip to Japan. But you know, that's a different region than the area we're talking about today. So today we're on the Middle East and Dawn, welcome to this session. Thanks, Jeanette, and thank you guys so much for inviting me uh, to participate. I'm really excited. I have had um, the privilege of watching videos of some of the previous sessions and um, of uh, some of the different events in the sh um, series. So um, anyway, I'm uh, really mm. happy to be a part of it. Um, let's see, I'm sharing my screen. Can you guys see it? I think now, hopefully in slideshow mode. Um, so as Jeanette said, um, I went to Israel with my husband and two children um, over the summer of 2018 as part of an international blended master's program um, that was facilitated by Hebrew University. I had a semester of online learning before the summer intensive and then another semester of online learning following my summer intensive. Um, and this was an opportunity for me to, um, I guess, fulfill a goal and desire that I'd had for over 25 years. I um, first went to Israel when I was 17 years old on a program for high school students and I spent six weeks um, learning about the country, traveling and learning a little bit about the culture. Mm -hmm. And after that experience, I thought that I would study abroad in Israel as an undergraduate student and it didn't happen. So I thought maybe as a grad student, then life got in the way and never in a million years did I think I would be studying abroad with a husband and two children. But um, it was actually just such an amazing experience. And um, everybody says international experiences are life changing. But for this one, especially not just for me, but for my entire family to have the opportunity to live abroad, to experience a different culture um, to live in a completely different way than we live here, um, which was really um, outstanding. So this was a picture from the student village where we lived in an apartment um, looking down um, into Jerusalem from the Hebrew University campus. So one of the first things that we encountered. And um, we arrived in Israel the very end of June 2018 on a Friday afternoon um, getting later and later, in fact, making it to Jerusalem just before the Sabbath. And um, in Israel, in Jerusalem especially, everything shuts down for Shabbat, Friday evening until sundown on Saturday. So arriving at that time was a little bit nerve wracking because we weren't really sure whether we would um, have the various amenities we needed. We found that we didn't, but we managed to make do. And even just getting to our place, we were at the Kansas City airport and there was a problem. Our student apartment was not going to be ready until Sunday. And we were arriving Friday night, but they didn't tell me this until the day before we were leaving. So we didn't actually know where we were going to be going once we ar uh, arrived in Israel. 
and I'm in the Kansas City airport um, on the phone and they're giving me an address telling me show up and somebody will meet me and walk me to an apartment that we can stay in for the weekend and then we'll have a new apartment on Sunday. And so it was um, a bit rocky to say the least getting started on our experience. And the first night we were there in our little tiny student apartment versus our large Johnson County home. And my son who was um, not quite eight years old at the time was in tears because he missed his room and he missed his toys. Um, but um, the kind of happy ending is we came back at the end of the trip, we got back home and he cried because he missed being in Israel. So um, that just kind of gives you an idea of um, you know, how things progressed over the week. And just another view up from the apartment um, in Jerusalem, the buildings are all made out of the same stone, the Jerusalem stone. And so you see kind of the, um, the cream color throughout the landscape, um, both in the old city and the new, and I'll have pictures of both areas. And so we made it to our student housing um, just before or right as the sun was setting and Shabbat was starting. And we managed to uh, get a little bit of food because um, the, um, the, the people that were guarding kind of the area, it was, um, there were armed guards at the gates for the student village and helped us order a pizza and have it delivered, thankfully from one of the few places that hadn't closed yet. And, and we had Shabbat uh, basically before I started my program um, first thing Monday morning. So we had um, Shabbat and really one day to acclimate um, to it. So we didn't do much. Um, we kind of caught up on sleep and again, walked around the neighborhood, explored a little bit um, since it was Shabbat. But after um, Shabbat ends, the city really comes to life. And we happened to get there during the Jerusalem Light Festival, which was held at the Old City. And um, you see here, uh, they had a light show that was projected on the walls of the Old City. And um, it's an event that's about building community and promoting peace. And through um, inspirational quotes that went on for several weeks. Um, and I thought, I was really touched by the fact that the quotes, every quote that they projected onto the wall with the different images and lights, they projected in Hebrew, English, and Arabic. And so um, that was just something that struck me that really added to the beauty of the experience. But you can see just the crowds of people. I was thinking with some of these images and the crowds of people you'll see at different points, you know, I can't even imagine what it's like in the times of COVID to be outside of the market before Shabbat. I'll show you some pictures or um, other things that where Shabbat ends and the city comes to life because the streets are just crowded. Everybody is, um, is out enjoying the community. And so I just thought that was a really nice image of the walls to the old city. And so as far as my experience, it was a, I was a student and it was an intensive program. It was a six week, a semester crammed into six weeks. So we spent quite a bit of time in the classroom on the Hebrew University of campus. I had class um, five days a week, at least six to eight hours a day. Um, but thankfully there were days that we went on tours where they took us out um, into not only Jerusalem, but also um, other surrounding areas. We spent an afternoon in Tel Aviv visiting the um, certain um, Independence Hall, for example, the, um, the spot where Yitzhak Rabin was um, assassinated. Um, we visited um, the um, Dead Sea um, and Masada and Qumran where the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered. Um, so we had, they're called Tiulim, which are tours basically. So we had some um, informal educational experiences outside of the classroom, thank goodness, because otherwise um, it wasn't a lot different than sitting in a JCCC classroom other than being um, a lot smaller and more crowded, I'd say, and older in terms of the building um, with kind of plain walls. But this was um, one of the Tiulim where we were learning about the geography and history of Jerusalem. And you see, this is the group, the cohort that I was studying with 
um, and then a couple of the views that we saw. Um, there's Jerusalem um, has a series of hills and or mountains and that overlook different parts of the city. So Hebrew University's main campus is at the top of one Mount Scopus, but here we're at the top of another, getting different perspectives on the city in conjunction with our um, Jerusalem in literature course um, and some of our history. Um, one of our Tiulim took us into the old city, and these were some pictures I took in the old city and um, in the Jewish quarter. This was the first two are as we were walking down to the Western Wall, which is the archaeological remains of the Second Temple um, and the most sacred place in Judaism. But you can see other sacred sites as well, including the Dome of the Rock as you're walking down um, um, to the kind of closer area to the wall, which you see on the side um, of the screen um, as well. And so that was a place that we spent um, uh, some time as a class. We spent a couple days in the old city afternoons um, learning about some of the history and um, communities and neighborhoods. But it's also a place that my family and I visited on multiple occasions when we had days off or time together. Um, so a, a very meaningful um, experience for us. I think one of the things that was made this such a meaningful experience for my family is that uh, my background is in Judaism. Uh, my husband's not Jewish, but we have a Jewish home and we're raising our children in the Jewish tradition. And so until this trip, their only experience of Judaism is in a country that's predominantly Christian, where we're a minority religion and where Judaism is a part of our home and our lives, but it's not a part of a daily life of the society that we're embedded in. And um, so, for example, on Monday of, of this week, actually, um, my children didn't attend school. It was Yom Kippur. It was one of the Jewish high holidays, the Day of Atonement. Um, you know, and I every year make arrangements and let them know, but they had standardized testing that was scheduled. Um, you know, we'd never experienced that on obviously Christmas or Easter. Their children are not in school. Children don't, um, you know, wouldn't have something like that scheduled. But for us, um, you know, we've had things where my sons had to miss field trips or they have had testing and other things um, scheduled on our holy days. So it was a really different experience to be living in a culture where rather than being a minority and um, we were um, part of a majority and where we saw Judaism and Jewish life um, embedded in that culture and celebrated. We were um, uh, one of the holidays while we were there, Tisha B'Av is a fast holiday that commemorates the destruction of the second temple. And so that was a day that the city of Jerusalem, um, like on the Sabbath, everything was shut down. Um, people aren't out doing anything. Even we actually were in Tel Aviv and even the beaches of Tel Aviv, like that's one of the very few days that you won't see anybody out on the beach in Tel Aviv, very, very few people out on the beaches. So that was a really interesting um, experience for us. And I think very impactful, um, you know, especially on my children experiencing that at young ages. My son, as I said, was not quite eight and my daughter was 11 when we were there. Um, this is also in the old city of Jerusalem. And so um, some of the archeological remains, the cardo in here in the center is remains of a Roman street. And over here you see um, the old city is built in layers. And so um, you can kind of see that um, down below, you've got the a marketplace in the old city um, as well. Um, this is the Shuk, the marketplace in Jerusalem um, that is the new contemporary marketplace. And my husband in the mornings after he'd take the kids to camp would have time to walk around and get to see the Shuk open up and come to life. So before all of the vendor stalls open, um, graffiti art is, um, very popular and so these are the, the stall doors when they're down. And this is the Shook on a Friday morning um, or late morning, early afternoon before the Sabbath. And again, you can see how crowded everybody's there doing their shopping, getting their fresh um, foods to prepare a Sabbath meal. 
Um, and then the produce was absolutely amazing. Um, you know, I, I had a hard time eating salads when I came home just because they didn't taste nearly as good because everything was so fresh and beautiful and delicious when we were there. And um, the spices are the other thing that, um, you know, we really loved. My husband's a chef, so um, this was, you know, great fun for us to explore the market and pick up foods. Um, speaking of um, foods, we greatly enjoyed, we ate falafel at least a couple times a week. And my husband, again, a chef um, who's always worked at somewhat meat-centric restaurants, said he could actually be a vegan if we were living in Israel uh, because the Israeli, um, the falafel, he could just eat nonstop. Um, and over here you have a traditional Israeli breakfast. I don't know how traditional the omelet part is, but tomato and cucumber salad, lots of little salads and, and desserts and then basket of bread and back behind it. Um, this was one of our favorite streets in Jerusalem and just the different architecture, but the beautiful, cheerful colors of the umbrellas we really enjoyed. And um, Ben Yehuda Street is a pedestrian street with restaurants and shops in um, the center of Jerusalem, not in the old city, but in the more modern area. And we encountered a troop of Girl Scouts selling cookies. So we thought that that was kind of uh, fun and a nice connection for Nina, a little bit different than we do it here. Um, this is the beach in Tel Aviv, the sunset, uh, but I have a couple others of the Tel Aviv, Yaffa area, and just, um, you know, the architecture, unlike anything, the history, the architecture, unlike anything that we have and experience um, here in the States, and again, all of the different salads and dips of uh, Mediterranean um, food, something that I uh, miss and you just can't quite replicate in the United States. Um, this was um, going into the desert um, as we were going to visit the Dead Sea, so as we reached sea level. Um, and then this is on the top of Masada, which is, was a fortress um, that um, several Jews, a community of Jews fled to um, to flee the Romans, but eventually they conquered as well. And the view is overlooking the Dead Sea. Um, and then here's my family at the Dead Sea. So we took advantage of um, the, the mud and as you can see, had some fun um, coating ourselves. And my son, it might look like he's sitting down and relaxing, but he is actually floating um, there in the Dead Sea. And you saw people holding newspapers and magazines, right, that as they were floating. Um, so um, that was great. And then just to, again, I kind of mentioned the different living conditions. And um, we lived in a two bedroom student apartment in Jerusalem, and this was the size of both bedrooms. When we arrived, even though they knew it was going to be a family of four, each bedroom only had one little twin size bed that is not even the width of our own twin size beds here. Um, and yet two of us were supposed to be sleeping in each bedroom in one of those beds. So we managed to get a couple of additional beds, but, um, you know, very um, kind of bare bones and minimal compared to, um, you know, our living conditions in Johnson County, but, um, but something that, um, you know, we got used to and didn't mind. And I think that we would easily trade um, to go back and experience again. Um, and then this was just a sign that we saw kind of on the street on an electrical box or something, I think. Um, but um, I thought that, you know, it was kind of a nice sentiment because, um, one of the things we experienced is that even though, um, you know, there are a lot of tensions that continue to exist and every weekend we would hear about bombings and, um, you know, fighting shootings and shooting in um, some of the contested areas, um, you know, we also saw um, communities most so super fast but hopefully that gave you a feel for our experience and I'll look forward to your questions thanks so much Don and I loved that quote at the end and the pictures and now I'm really hungry but uh, we will so if you have questions for Don you can type them later or type them at any time our next speaker is Dessa Crum who is the coordinator for international and immigrant student services and a faculty member in the English for Academic Purposes program. 
Dessa lived in Turkey for three years where she taught English, explored the countryside, and drank a lot of tea. Welcome, Dessa. Unmute, that's a good start. Okay. Yeah, so I lived there from uh, 2013 to 2016. Um, so I went, I actually went to Turkey. It's kind of a story of travel leads to more travel. I'd studied abroad in Budapest, Hungary. Um, and one of my closest friends there was Turkish. So during the semester break, I went to Turkey with her. I got to visit her hometown of Izmir on the coast, meet her family. We went to Istanbul. And then we also went uh, in the middle of Turkey, in the center to Cappadocia, where the, there are these uh, beautiful rock formations. So um, this is a man doing his absolute best at the market to sell his socks. Um, so then, so in 2013, I finished college and I decided I, I loved my experience, just my brief experience with Dila in Turkey. So I looked for a job and I was able to find one at a teaching at a prep school in, um, in Gaziantep, Turkey in the Southeast. So Gaziantep, Turkey, um, it's right on the cusp of what would be considered um, Kurdistan by the Kurds in Eastern Turkey. So you have, you have a really mixed population in Gaziantep. So you have Turks, you have Kurds. Um, it's also very close to Syria. So you have a, a lot of um, Syrians too. The first time I tried to speak um, Turkish to somebody, they, they, did, they spoke Arabic. So um, very diverse. This is um, Castle in the downtown. They have a fantastic mosaic museum of still just really intact mosaics. Um, and so they also have a bit of a, of a housing crisis. They've got a shortage, so you're always seeing new places being built. This is like a new city being built that I could see from my office window. Charsha, so the downtown Charsha in Gaziantep is, is gorgeous. You can buy a lot of uh, authentic metalwork. It's very busy, um, a, a lot of ancient buildings. Um, everywhere I lived, you could always hear the call to prayer every place I lived. Um, this was inside, it was a friend and teacher, Turkish teacher of mine, Sitar. This is his courtyard. So we would study Turkish here. Um, Gaziantep is known, uh, it's a huge pistachio production area. So Fustuk is the name. Um, I always thought it was cute. You can use the word Fustuk means pistachio, but you can also use it as a kind of cutesy name for your girlfriend or darling. Um, so some would say that baklava was invented there. That's obviously disputed, but regardless, they have fantastic baklava. Um, this guy was making another dish with, with fustuk, with pistachio called kotmer. He was super excited. He'd just been to some food show in New York and beautiful cafes. My friend Ali attempting to teach me uh, tabla, backgammon is, is played in a lot of places. Gaziantep was also um, a part of the old silk road or Ipek Yolu in Turkey. She'll see that written every place. So here we're actually, um, it's an iftar dinner, so a breaking of the fast dinner during Ramadan or, or Ramadan. Um, so even though I didn't participate in that, I was frequently invited to those dinners. And this dinner is taking place in an old building that would have been a stop for caravans going uh, on the Silk Road. This, so there were many, many day trips you could take outside of Gaziantep, including Gubekli Tepe. So th this is known as um, the birthplace of religion. It's ancient. Um, they're trying to, trying to keep that intact. Um, but there's just, just fantastic ruins everywhere. This is Shanlurfa, so um, said to be the birthplace of Abraham. There's a beautiful mosque, this um, huge pool full of fish. This is in Hatay or Antakya, so a little part of Turkey that kind of stretches down. It's got Syria on one side and the Mediterranean on the other. Um, both schools that I worked at would, would organize day trips sometimes. So this was actually organized by one of the schools. I got to visit both the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. So this is the Euphrates um, exploring along here. Oops. Oops. Oh, there we go. Um, I also got to go to Mount Nemrut. Um, people go there to watch the sunset and sunrise, but there's also these ancient heads. So they originally had been up there. Um, really, you, there's lots of mountains and lots of places to get a good view of a sunset. So it kind of made sense to go and explore the heads while everybody was looking at the, the sunrise. 
it was cold and then um, by the afternoon it was warm enough to go swimming. Marden is a, a more Kurdish city in, in the eastern part. So you see the picture of this restaurant here is actually next to the, the minaret here. So you look back one side, you have, um, you have the, the castle, you look out the other way, you have Mesopotamia. Or you can walk away from the city and get a great stunning view um, looking back. So um, again, so here's, it's more of a, of a Kurdish city. So there are still some disputes that happen there between the Turkish government and the Kurds. So um, I was kind of wandering up by the castle and these two boys decided to tell me to maybe watch out where I wander. Um, sheep crossing, animal crossings, it's very common. This guy's waving, thank you. Um, there was a big Kurdish win in the election that time when I was there. So we have these, fly, these flags up. Um, and lots going on on the streets when we were leaving. Uh, when I visited Martin, uh, Martin, I got to meet Ahmed, who was an English teacher in Syria, um, and was absolutely insistent that we spend our last night in his home um, eating dinner with him. He was extremely, extremely generous. So we did drive um, past part of the border when we were on that trip. So I spent a year in Gaziantep over here, and then I moved to Antalya for two years. So um, big feature of Antalya, it's on the Mediterranean, it's gorgeous. This beach here, I was always uh, either a 10 minute walk or a 10 minute bicycle ride to that beach so I could, I could go after work. And this is the view from my office. Just, it was stunning. Um, this is that main beach. There was a big canyon, like 30 minutes outside of town you could go to on the weekends. This was, whoops, pretty much in my neighborhood. You could bike to the mountains. This is Kaleichi, so it, uh, it literally means within the castle. So you can see this old Roman harbor in the heart of the city. You can see the walls here. Um, so it's just there's lots of restaurants, cafes, hotels, shops in there. Uh, you, so you can participate in that, or you can just go down here and hang out like these fishermen are doing with a great view. And Hadrian's Gate, so this was one of the, the main entrance to Kaleichi. Uh, more of Kalichi. My mother got to visit. I was really happy my mom got to come for a week. So that's us hanging down in the, the downtown area. Uh, and then so we rented a car. It was pretty easy to rent a car and drive out west. So you could rent and you know go to different cities there, get on a boat and explore. Or when you're driving, there are places you could just stop and go down to the beach. Um, kind of have your own little beach for the afternoon. It was gorgeous. Again, just ruins absolutely everywhere, just all over. I saw many amazing amphitheaters. It's just, it's just everywhere. Um, more of that. So there's just so many people have been there. This was a, a, a stereotypical Lycian tomb. Um, I'd never even heard of the Lycian people before I went to Turkey. They used to uh, have the southern coast of Turkey. So again, just stunning places. This was in Antalya, the, the city proper, so you could you know, go to the pebble beach or the sand beach, or you could go by the cliffs and hang out. Um, this man was a really interesting man we met on one of our trips. Uh, I can't remember his real name, but he told me everybody called him the fish man, and he had really fresh eel in his boat that he got out, killed, gave to us to bring to a cafe to get cooked. And then we actually um, hired him out to take us on a private boat tour in this uh, Delta area. This was another school trip, um, again, really close to the city of Antalya. So you could swim in this little pool that was on top of the waterfall then walk down and swim down there. This is one of my favorite places. So this is called Sulu Ada, which means water or watery island. It's not the best name for an island, but it's gorgeous. So you can see it here and behind me. These pictures were taken on the island. Um, it's the clearest water I've ever seen. There is nothing on the island. There's not a bathroom. There's not a kiosk. There's just fantastically clear water. Uh, this is kind of just an, a main road in Antalya. This is after a football game. So um, this will happen at least several times a year. One of the three major um, or soccer teams will play. And it's a bit scary at first if you don't know what's going on. But um, that will be heavily celebrated in the streets. So. So these were um, students over here and students down here. Um, you know, the, the Turks have great natural areas and they really do appreciate them. So there's 
often you know places you can barbecue outside picnic outside just great places um then these were co-workers from the school um we also went out on a boat trip once with co-workers Food. Um, so here, this is every neighborhood will have its own marketplace. So completely agree with Don. I miss the freshness of the produce all the time. Um, so you get that for really cheap. You could also buy clothes such as these really cozy pants that this lady's wearing. They would be so great right now and during this, this kind of shut down pandemic time. But um, Turkish bagel, common Turkish food. These are people lining up for shikimbe and kokorech. So the tripe soup and a, a lamb intestine sandwich. I promise you they're really good. Uh, more food. So again, just amazing soups, fresh salads. This is a typical kebab. Um, Turkish breakfast will just have plates and plates of great things. Olives, tomatoes, cucumbers, fresh bread, cheese. Um, and of course, you have to have your Turkish tea. So this, this is actually my favorite dish. This is uh, manta, it's a dumpling. It's a bit harder to find because it takes a long time to make. Um, and then stuffed mussels you can get along the beach. If there's any morel hunters here, I'd just like you to know you can actually find morel mushrooms in parts of Turkey. Um, this was the cat that I had. I spoiled her with bacon jerky once when I came back to visit. And I have to say I love Turkish food, but when I lived in Turkey, I really missed um, the variety of food that we have here. Now that I'm back in the US, I really miss Turkish food. <laughs> so, but Kansas City is luckily getting some options. Um, tea, so tea is all over. People will be walking around selling tea. After you, you, know, after you have a meal, you should um, sit and have a cup of tea with people or just take a break and have tea. Um, the tea itself is amazing but I really think it, it symbolizes um, a different pace in life. So, you know, it's, it's important to stop and take those breaks and um, it's easier to do in Turkey with all the tea. Uh, so these are just a few other things, kind of random things. This was so common to see in places with water where you'd have a restaurant and you could sit and eat and have your feet in the water. It's just such, such a clever idea. Uh, along Turkey, all along the roads, you'll find lamp posts that have a button that you can push and a taxi will come. It's like pre-Uber, just super easy to get a taxi. You will see a lot of animals, a lot of uh, dogs and cats outside on the streets. Um, some of them will be adopted by some restaurants and there were efforts, at least in Antalya, to make um, shelters for the cats. Ataturk, I realized I'd gone through this, this, all these pictures and I didn't have a picture of Ataturk, but you will see Ataturk, the founder of modern Turkey, all over Turkey. He has the biggest mausoleum I've ever seen in the capital of Ankara. Um, and if you ever end up there teaching English and you're having problems getting a student to talk, if you pretend like you don't know who Ataturk is, they'll likely talk to you. It's a, it's a good trick to know. Um, in the summer of, um, in July of 2016, I was in the U.S. visiting. I had made my way to New York City and was hoping to go back to Turkey. Um, and I got a bit delayed because there was a coup attempt in Turkey. So um, there's, you know, a lot of different opinions about what happened. Um, but I will say is if you're an American and you decide to travel to Turkey, you should be aware that the, the current, current president and his party and many, many Turks do feel that there might have been a connection between um, this uh, Muslim cleric Fetzel Gulen, who's in self-exile in the U.S. Um, and the, the U.S. will not extradite him. So that's, you could be asked about that. Um, <laughs> there were a lot of changes after that. Um, many people were let go, many people were arrested. The director and assistant director of the school that I worked for were both imprisoned. Um, I lost my job, many teachers lost their jobs. I was extremely fortunate. I still got a severance pay, a flight home, and I had a month, so a fair amount of time off um, to explore when I was there. But many, many others were not that fortunate and there's still, still issues because of that today in Turkey. Um, yeah, I was lucky. <laughs> so I got to get some more free time in Turkey and went to see the Black Sea region, um, which was also just absolutely stunning. So I got to do that um, and, then, and then came home. Um, I think Turkey is, you know, it's a prime, my experience there is a prime example that we fall in love with the people of a country and, you know, not necessarily the, the politics. So um, 
I really miss it and I would encourage absolutely anybody who gets the opportunity to see Turkey to do so. Thank you. Oh. Sorry about that, guys. Um, I was talking away to myself. I was saying that for Dessa, just saying that travel leads to travel. Um, we see that a lot. We've seen that with a lot of you that are on this call. So um, we love that about you. And we love the fact that you're willing to share those experiences with the rest of us. And another example of that is our final speaker, who is Melanie Bevel Hall. Uh, Melanie teaches history and religion, including the courses The History of the Middle East and Islam, Religion, and Civilization. Melanie studied in Jerusalem as an undergraduate, and she has traveled in Morocco and in Jordan. In 2016, she co-led a JCCC study abroad program. And this is interesting strategy. They focused on the ancient Egyptian and Mesopotamian artifacts but that they were held in collections in Oxford, London, and Berlin. Uh, when we can travel again, Melanie is going to co-lead a JCCC study abroad trip to the Andalusia region of Spain to study its three cultures. And of course, those are the same three cultures that you can encounter in the Middle East. So welcome, Melanie. Thank you. Let me pull up my screen here. Hopefully you can all see it. Okay. So, um, yeah, I got to do a study abroad program in Jerusalem as an undergrad way back in 1999 and then helped to lead a co-lead co a JCC study trip in um, 2012 back to Israel. Um, and I did spend time in Morocco, so I'm going to be talking about that with just a little side trip to Jordan. So, yeah, here we go. Israel, Palestine area, Jordan right next to it, and clear over to Morocco. That's where we're at on the map. So where Don was talking about um, being at Hebrew University, I was actually right next to that um, at the BYU Jerusalem Center. In fact, in one of Don's slides, you can see our campus. It was the one with all the arches. So here's from inside our building, all the arches looking down um, off of Mount Scopus over across Jerusalem. Um, so this is um, next to our campus uh, on the Mount of Olives, um, looking off across Jerusalem. And um, where we were located is, was like the Palestinian area, Arab area of Jerusalem, um, across from the Kadron Valley, and then the old city was behind. Um, just across the valley from us. So we'd often be, you know, walk, walk to the old city um, and enjoy time there. Um, this is a group of us on a Sabbath, um, just exploring a little bit. Um, not much since it's Sabbath, which Don already talked about. Um, at our campus, uh, they did a really good job with our curriculum, trying to make sure we were um, exposed to both sides of everything. In fact, while we were there, we didn't call it Israel or Palestine. We were in Jerusalem or the Holy Land because there's a Holy Land for everybody, right? And so we had professors. Um, so you see on the left side of the screen, that's our rabbi um, who was sharing a Sabbath dinner with us. Um, and we had Muslim professors who had teach us about um, history, of the, history of the Middle East from an Arab perspective and Islam. We had archaeology professors. We, they, on the campus, they employed both Israelis and um, Palestinians and just tried to make it um, a place where we could get kind of all perspectives as we studied. So, like Don, we'd spend that time in class, but then we would go on field trip. And I was there for four months for a full fall semester. So we got to see kind of everything. It was pretty great. So as Don talked about, Jerusalem is a holy city for the three monotheistic religions. And she already showed you great pictures of the Western Wall, the remaining remnant of the Jewish temple. Um, in the center, you see this is um, the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem. 
and then the Dome of the Rock. And when I was there back in 1993, it was under renovation. <laughs> so we never got to see it beautifully gleaming and golden. But that's a great thing about travel is you never know what you're going to see um, and what's going to be different than how you expect it to be. So we did definitely get to study um, the three different religions and go on field trips to the sacred sites. As far as the culture, um, just getting to walk the streets and getting to know people. But we also had field trips where we went to um, like Pan a Palestinian refugee school with the children there in the center, um, a couple of those and some hospitals. On the right, um, we got to participate like in an olive harvest and you know, grind the olives to make oil and things like that. Cultural experiences that I would never have gotten growing up in Arizona or living here in Kansas now um, that were just wonderful and eye-opening. Um, the lady on the left carrying the big bundle, she, we would see her all the time in the old city selling her wares. So she's carrying her bundle there, but then she'd find a stop, uh, uh, she'd stop and find a, a little corner and lay out all of her goods to sell. Um, so it was just kind of interesting to see different ways of life and doing things. As far as history, the history of the Middle East is layers upon layers upon layers of history. From the dawns of the civilization, right, the beginning remnants of where um, people first started to settle down. Um, the area is, was a, it's a crossroads of um, where all of the, or many of the major world empires have controlled the area at one time or another, um, from the Assyrians and the Babylonians and the Greeks and the Romans, the Persians, um, and to the um, Umayyads and, and the different caliphates and sultanates and such. Um, so it just has so much history. So here, um, this is Jericho. So this is a Neolithic tower. It was a huge tower there in Jericho from the Neolithic period. But then Jericho is also famous for your biblical story of the Good Samaritan. So it was so fascinating going to places and seeing layers upon layers of history. And um, like Don and Dessa both said, you see Roman remnants everywhere. So this is the Roman aqueducts there. Masada, Don already talked about. Um, but again, layers of history. So this is Herod, King Herod's summer palace. So this is your um, time in history, your Christian history, at the, right around the time of the birth of Christ with King Herod, right? Um, but you also have your Jewish history, the war with Rome, 70 AD, and the big Roman siege ramp going up there. And this is the siege machine, the Roman siege machines. And then you have your um, well, she talked about the 73, the um, last zealot holdout there in Masada. Um, and then it ties in with some modern history um, with the state of Israel. Um, I guess ask me about that later. I, I won't take time now. But it's, it's just fascinating to see how um, so much of world history um, just kind of intersected there. As far as politics, um, here we are on the borders of Lebanon. You can see, you know, the Israeli flag, the Lebanon flag there. Um, and you see us with the soldiers there. Everyone in Israel um, has to serve in the military. And so you see soldiers everywhere. Um, well, the big thing that happened while I was there, we were um, on a field trip in Sinai when the Oslo Peace Accords were signed in 1993. And so when we got back to Jerusalem the next day, it was um, amazing. But everyone was out on the streets celebrating. You had Israelis and Palestinians together in the street celebrating that at last they were going to work for peace and have two states, a Palestinian state, who you got the map here, the Palestinian state in the West Bank and Gaza Strip and Israel. And that was the plan. And for the first time, Palestinians could just fly their flag, that's the flag here in the center, without getting arrested. So everyone was so hopeful and so excited. Yay, peace is possible. <laughs> and so that was kind of a great time to be there and to witness that moment in history. Um, we also got to do a, a week trip to Jordan. Um, so here we are in Amman, Jordan. And you can see the beautiful mosque there. 
And you can see in the background here the, the Roman amphitheater, like I think Dessa said that amphitheaters are everywhere, right? Um, but our big like woohoo experience in, in Jordan was going to Petra. So think Indiana Jones Last Crusade, right? So we're on our horses going through the Crescent Valley and we turn the corner and boom, there's Petra. And um, this is the scene, the shot that's probably you're most familiar with from Indiana Jones and the Last Crusades. But again, um, an amazing archeological site with the, the Arab and Nabataean peoples who um, set up this trading post there in the, the middle of the desert and um, were so wealthy that the Greeks tried to conquer them and then the Romans did. And then eventually with the trades routes changing, it, it was abandoned. But this beautiful city carved out of this um, amazingly colorful stone, it was, it was really impressive. So in a nutshell, that was my undergrad experience. So the so what, right? My, as I study history, I always ask my students, so what? So what did you learn? Well, why this trip was so like life-changing for me <laughs> Um, it, and it was life-changing. Travel, I think, like Jeanette says, it always is life-changing. Is um, I fell in love with the history and the culture and the people and the religions, and I just um, became fascinated with it. So I came home and I changed my major from a physics major, which was going to change anyway, I'm sure. Um, I don't speak calculus like it's a language. So I changed my major to Near Eastern Studies for my undergrad, um, my bachelor's, and then when I got my master's in history, I focused on the Middle East, which then led me to teach at JCCC. And in 2012, um, I was able to co-lead a study trip back to Israel um, with Orit Kamara, who used to teach Hebrew here. She's an Israeli. And um, so here's our JCC group, or part of them, at Masada again. Um, it's, if you get a chance to try travel somewhere and then go back, like this was almost 20 years later, 19 years later, when I went back, um, it's amazing to see the changes. So yes, the Dome of the Rock was gold and gleaming, right? It wasn't under construction. But I think the most striking thing for me was to see a wall between Israel and Palestine. Because when I had left in 1993, um, there was so much hope for peace. 20 years later, broken promises on both sides and tensions and disputes and, and such, um, they finally put a wall for security's sake. Um, and that was really, really disheartening for me to see. Um, I was like, oh, you know, <laughs> we were, I was hopeful peace would work out. And I mean, there's still working towards that and hopefully someday we they do have peace. Um, but despite that, it was great to go back and to see, um, go back to some of the same places, Caesarea, Philippi, but um, to see the culture. So I, I love, one thing I love about this area of the world is um, you've got these ancient Roman, you know, 2000 year old Roman runes and you're having a cultural event happen there. It was around Purim time. So people were gathering to celebrate. And um, so you have the ancient and the modern all mixed together. And it's just there. And, and sometimes we, in our young country, just don't always appreciate um, the ancient and, and having you know ancient history right there as you live. So that's kind of cool. We got to go to some kibbutzim and, and enjoy their learning about the history of the kibbutz um, movement and then the role that played in Israel. And that's a crusader fortress. One reflection I wanted to share with you um, about, you know, the sites in Jerusalem and the Israel area. So we went to the Jordan River for both trips. And the first time I was there, um, obviously this is a, a great um, pilgrimage spot for Christians, a place where Jesus was baptized. So in the first um, picture, you can see a group of people from Texas. They are Southern Baptists, and they are getting baptized in the Jordan River. Everybody say, hallelujah, amen. And they're all so excited, and it was so fun to watch. The second time I was there, um, there was a group of Roman Orthodox pilgrims who were um, there to be baptized, and it, they too were very excited to be baptized in the Jordan River, but it was much more somber, and 
the priest, you can see the priest there in black and he had his incense and he's chanting. And um, so it's really interesting to reflect on um, two different branches of Christianity um, approaching the same place, doing a similar, you know, same type of a ritual um, in a different manner, um, but kind of with the same heart. And so that was kind of an interesting thing to see the diversity um, being shown there as, you know, I watched these different pilgrims. I also got to go to the Baha'i Gardens in Haifa, which was awesome. So I know I need to hurry. So um, one thing I loved about going to Jerusalem and to Israel and Jordan is, um, and, and then maybe it was because I was there when there was the, the Oslo Peace Accords were being assigned, as, were, being signed um, and that hope for peace, but I really started to research and um, look into times in history when Jews, Christians, and Muslims lived side by side, coexisted, and lived in peace and, and thrived. So a couple years ago, my colleague Stacy Davidson and I um, went and researched Spain and Morocco to look at those ideas of a time, the golden age of Spain, um, golden age of Islam, when Muslims, Christians, and Jews did live side by side. They all did contribute to um, a time of advancement and learning. So part of that trip was going to Morocco. Um, so this is Fez, which um, when the great thing about going to Morocco is seeing kind of the whole structure of how these um, Muslim cities were put together. So you see the gate there going into the Medina, the city. Um, and then you would have the palace of the caliph or the sultan. And next to the palace would be the Jewish quarter. Because in Islam, um, there, there's the command to respect the peoples of the book, the Christians and Jews um, and Zoroastrians. Peoples of, the, of Holy Scripture um, are to be respected and protected. So the Jewish quarter would be right by the palace so that um, they'd be under the protection of the king. Um, this is a madrasa, a school of learning, and we did get to see like one of the oldest universities ever, which is really cool. But I wanted to show you kind of that perspective. So here in Fez, this is a synagogue in Fez. And um, the Moroccans kind of love their Jews. Um, and you talk to Moroccan people and they're like, yeah, my Jewish brother. Um, so most Moroccan Jews have immigrated to Israel, but Morocco has an interesting law that um, Jews who want to return can have dual, dual citizenship. They are welcome to come go back to Morocco. Morocco would be happy to have them. So there are still Arab families who um, maintain and upkeep the Jewish synagogues and cemeteries there. So this is one in Fez, and this is one in Essaouira. So this was really a kind of a great moment. Um, our Muslim tour guide is taking us through the synagogue and there's this Jewish man there who was, um, who was part of restoring the synagogue. And it was so fun to watch the two of them talk together about their common history and their common hopes for the future. And it really um, just was one of those moments where it, I think that if we, as in the world, we talked about um, and looked for our commonalities, we might be able to put aside some of our differences. Um, the more we can come together, I feel like we can find peace better than when we focus in on um, our differences. More Roman ruins. Um, so I know I'm out of time, so I will just stop here with some goats in a tree, so. We'll let you ask some questions. Because who can outdo goats in a tree? You know? Right. <laughs> um, so my first question is, why were there goats in the tree? OK, so that was so fun. So you have these goat herds, like a shepherd, right, along the side of the road. And they, would, they just had these like platforms in the tree. And their goats would climb up in the tree and graze in the trees. Because that's where the leaves were. And it was the coolest. It was really fun. Yeah. I think I've heard of goat soccer in Pakistan, something like that. So anyway, um, we have just a few minutes. If, uh, if any of you are going to need to leave, let me just um, tell you this. A week from now, we will not actually have this speaker series. Our peace building conference is going to resume. 
And we've talked a lot about peace today. This coming Wednesday at two o'clock, we're gonna zoom in a speaker from the US Institute of Peace, who will talk about the prospects for peace in Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. She's a great speaker and that's a difficult region of the world. So I've put the Peace Building Conference website address in the chat. You can address, you can get the registration link there or just email studyabroad at jccc.edu and we'll send you to the registration link. And then two weeks from today, this series will resume where we have a couple of speakers zoom in from Europe to talk about working for a multinational corporation. So I hope that um, anybody interested in international careers will be especially interested with that. But after having said that, for those of you who could stick around, including our speakers, Perhaps they would uh, give us a little bit of time if you have questions. And my question is this, all of you all went to a region of the world that is really easy to misunderstand if you're an American. And so let me ask you, as you talked with people about your experiences, what were some common misconceptions that you think we in Kansas City have of the regions where you lived and worked and traveled and studied? I can answer. Um, people are always thinking that it's super dangerous because, I mean, it is an area of unrest, right? So they're always thinking that it, it's just too dangerous to go there. Um, and in fact, when we were there with the JCC trip in, in Israel, we're in Tel Aviv and there were some um, bombings and missile things happening down in the southern part of Israel, and we didn't even know what was happening. Um, so I think. It's just kind of a way of life to be prepared for tensions there, um, to be alert, to be wise, but they're just also living their lives. And so sometimes we're like, oh, it's so scary to go, but most likely if you go and travel, you <laughs> won't run into any issues. I would echo that. I mean, just some of the, um, the information that I had to provide because I, this was part of my sabbatical project and international education. Um, I was awarded an international education grant to um, help with my airfare for my trip. And um, so the, um, the information I had to provide for risk management about where we were living, where I was going to be, how we were getting around transportation wise and things um, was unlike any other international travel experience I've had with JCCC. And, and that was, you know, kind of an interesting experience for me. But I also think, um, you know, Melanie, actually, it's really interesting. My first trip to Israel was also 1993. And uh, I saw your picture at the Lebanese border. And I thought, we were, I was there. I have a very similar picture. I had one. My pictures, unfortunately, got ruined in a flood. But um, anyway, and then the next day, we found out from people, from relatives back home, that there was some exchange of fire at the Lebanese border the day after we'd been there. And parents were very concerned. I was with a group of teenagers. But um, you feel very secure. And I think that, um, I think people have a misperception that, that people don't get along, right? That everybody's like fighting with each other constantly. And I think that's a misperception that there, um, you know, there are Arabs and Israelis and Palestinians that get along and live in communities together. Um, and you see that when you're there, but but that's not the perspective that you get up from from the outside and from the media and things like that. Um, so that was just something that struck me. Also struck me um, that for me, getting the mindset to go back 25 years later, because when I went in 1993, we weren't allowed to take public transportation. Um, they were having a lot of problems with terrorist attacks and other kinds of things at that time. And so, whereas we took buses everywhere when we were there um, in 2018. And so kind of having people reaffirm for me that that was safe to take my family on the buses, um, you know, just because of the way that things are portrayed in the previous experiences, that was kind of interesting. Dessa, any thoughts? Yes, I, I would agree. I think um, whenever I came home to visit or talk to people, it'd be, oh, it's so dangerous, it's so dangerous. Um, and, and some dangerous things did happen and there were issues. But um, I mean, there were conflicts in the country. But I felt um, just as safe in Turkey as I did here. In fact, sometimes I would say I, I, there were times I felt more at danger in the US than there. Um, 
I think one thing I, I noticed, I, I think people seem to think that if, um, if a Muslim woman is covered, that they're going to be very quiet and reserved and won't open up. But that's certainly not at all what I noticed with my students. That doesn't, that doesn't mean anything. So, but I feel like there's kind of that idea there. Um, I've been asked and reminded to announce that tomorrow at two o'clock, our great decisions group will meet and Dessa and John, who's on this call, lead that. We will have a guest speaker who lives in Geneva and works with the UN to fight against human trafficking. So that will be really a thought provoking session and any, you are all welcome back for that. And if you would like to have that link, you can contact Dessa John or contact me. You can email studyabroad at jccc.edu and we'll try to tell you how to register. Um, I don't see any more questions and we are past time. So I am just gonna thank you all for coming, especially huge thank you for our speakers. Um, it is a part of the world that is somewhat misunderstood and your presentations were awesome. And John is giving you clappy hands and I'll give you jazz hands. And so thanks so much. And we hope to see many of you back next Wednesday to hear about Afghanistan, Pakistan, and India. Have a good rest of the afternoon. <laughs>